<laughs> Perfect timing. All right. Hello, everyone. This is our parent education night for October 20th, 2020. I have special guest counselor Taryn Thompson here, and she is going to be presenting on suicide prevention, a definite thing that is very important for all of us to talk about. Um, at this time, we do not have any parent guests, but I am recording this, obviously, and we will be posting it on the school's medias for everyone to watch at their own convenience. So off to you, Miss Thomas. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen and get the presentation started. All right. Okay, so here we go. Um, suicide awareness and prevention. Um, obviously, very important topic, um, especially right now. Across the country, we have seen an increase in anxiety, depression, um, and suicidal ideation in teens for a plethora of reasons um, that we're only just now beginning to understand. I think um, the pandemic has a lot to do with it and not having access to normal social interactions, um, doing a lot of work through screens, um, maybe school is not looking like it normally does, not having access to friends and support systems. So we're going to talk about what we can do about it. I wanna start off with a couple of myths that are pretty common. Um, the first being that talking about suicide or asking someone if they feel suicidal will encourage suicide attempts. Actually, talking about suicide provides the opportunity for communication and fears that are shared or more likely to diminish or get smaller. The first step in encouraging a person with thoughts of suicide to live comes from talking about those feelings. So getting the conversation started and being open to talking about those things and the feelings and where it's coming from is really important. Just asking someone about suicide does not give them those thoughts. The next is that people who threaten suicide are just seeking attention. I personally believe as a counselor and just a human that behavior is purposeful, um, meaning that all behavior has a reason behind it, even if we're not really sure what that is. So all suicide attempts really needed to be treated as though the person has the intent to die not to be dismissed as simply an attention gaining device. It's likely that they've tried to get attention in other ways and um, the ways that they seek attention will become more and more extreme if they're ignored. So the attention that they do get from an attempt might be what they need to save their lives. I'm gonna talk about some statistics. Um, most of these are from researcher surveys prior to 2018. So we know that right now the numbers are a little bit higher, um, but they haven't all been analyzed and condensed yet. So suicide is the second leading cause of death among children aged 10 to 14. That's pretty shocking considering. Um, girls are also more likely to have suicidal thoughts than boys and they attempt suicide three times as often. Suicide rates among males is four times higher than that of females. What they mean by that is the completed suicide rates. Suicide occurs equally across socioeconomic levels. Nearly all suicidal people try to let someone know how they feel before they attempt it. Each day in our country, there are an average of over 3,000 attempts by young people grades 9 to 12. If we included grades seven and eight, the numbers would be higher. And four out of five teens who attempt suicide have given clear warning signs. There are also some differences in populations um, and cultural variations in the rates of suicide and fatalities. Um, you can see here the statistics for different populations. And we know as well that LGBTQ plus youth are often considered to be at higher risk. Um, they experience more harassment, they feel unsafe, and sometimes they don't report any incidents of harassment or assault, and they may not have support systems at home. There are some elevated risk factors. Although there's no such thing as a suicidal type of person, there are certain behaviors or characteristics that might 
mean that they are at an elevated risk for suicidal thoughts. Um, that could be students with perfectionist personalities. Um, students that are very, very high achieving can still experience suicidal ideation, especially if they put a lot of pressure on themselves to perform and they may not be doing well at the moment. LGBTQ plus identifying students, learning disabled students also put a high amount of pressure on themselves and might feel that they are failing and cause um, a downward spiral into suicidal thoughts. Low self-esteem and a history of abuse or neglect can also be elevated factors. Warning signs. Um, this is super important to talk about because like the research shows, four out of five teens will show these warning signs before they make an attempt. So if we can spot these warning signs and we know what to do about it, then we can save lives. So some warning signs could be that they're more sad often than they're happy. They say they want to be left alone. They don't care if they get hurt. They might be self-harming. They start giving away personal belongings. They aren't sleeping or eating like normal. Um, school was, used to be important to them and now it isn't any longer. Or their friends and family aren't important to them anymore. Death and dying is more interesting. They might talk about it more. And things that used to make them happy no longer do. These are some common phrases we might hear from someone who's having suicidal thoughts. I want to go away. I want to kill myself. I wish I was dead. I can't stand living anymore. They might say it's hopeless. It's meaningless. Somebody would be better off without me or I wish I could sleep forever. No one would miss me or I don't care if I die. Um, a lot of these are phrases that people might hear from teenagers and think, oh, they're just trying to get attention or, oh, they're being sarcastic. They meant it as a joke. They're not serious. But it's really important that we take these things seriously and let students know that we are listening and we do take it seriously because it could be a cry for help. Now I'd like us to um, watch a TED talk from a teenager who survived a suicide attempt and now advocates for other teens. Suicide sucks. And it's really hard to talk about. Extremely hard. I think the reason that it's so hard for me specifically to talk about is because it's always going to be really real for me. On October 1st of 2015, I tried to kill myself. Since then, I still think about it every day, whether that be in the context of being ashamed of it or maybe walking myself through it again to see how I could help someone who's walking through it right now. Or maybe even just wishing I would have died that night. It's always going to be a part of my story. While I was writing this talk, I actually almost lost a good friend to suicide. So yeah, suicide is really real for me in a lot of aspects. And it's so hard to stand up here and to talk about it because talking about it makes it even more real. And I wish with my whole heart that it didn't have to be so real. I wish that if I just didn't talk about it, it would go away. But as they say, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I have to stop thinking it will go away. I have to stop begging for lives to be saved only within the four walls of my mind. I have to stop believing that silence is the answer when 44,000 people are still dying by suicide each year. I have to talk about it. We, we have to talk about it. So I'll start. I remember watching my anxiety turn into hating myself into thinking that I didn't deserve to live anymore. I remember what made me want to die. But the boldest memory I have from that night was the thought I had just before I tried to overdose. Why can't I just ask for help? I could hear my parents downstairs and my sister in the room next door. No part of me just kept begging myself to go tell one of them what I was feeling. But that part, that part was too small. 
the bigger part kept saying, Sadie, this, this has to be a secret. It kept telling me that I was alone and that no one would understand. It kept saying that I couldn't ask for help because asking for help would make me a burden. And God forbid I'd be a burden. Looking back, I really do wish I would have chosen to ask for help because I know now without a shadow of a doubt that my friends and family would have been there for me. But how was I supposed to know that those dark thoughts that I was having were thoughts I could have spoken out loud? If I had never heard anyone else say, hey, sometimes things get really dark and I wanna end my life, how was I supposed to know that if I reached out for help and I said those things, no one would have called me crazy? Now, it's a scary thing to walk up to even your closest friend and say, these thoughts in my head, they won't slow down and I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't focus, and I want to die. How can you be sure that they won't freak out and make it worse? Or even more so, how can you be sure that they wouldn't feel so burdened by your hurt that they would turn around and walk away? We don't know because nobody talks about it. In my experience with the multitude of kids I've encountered in not only a psychiatric facility, but also just within my school, suicidal people are terrified to ask for help because the whole idea of suicide has been stigmatized to the point where even those of us who struggle with it seem to believe we are in fact crazy. I truly believe that if suicidal people knew it was safe to ask for help, they would. So let's show them that it's safe. The first step, is to get educated. These things, they matter. According to the CDC, suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people. I believe that it needs to be common knowledge that suicide is not an issue of race, of gender, of class, of age, of sexual orientation. Suicide is a human issue. And once we grasp that idea, we are far more likely to take steps towards education because we then realize that no one is immune not us or our families. The next step under the umbrella of education is to use the resources we have available to not only learn the signs of suicide, which is extremely important, but also to understand that we have the power to halt suicide in its tracks. The following statistic breaks my heart and I hope that it breaks yours too. 81% of people who attempt suicide tell someone what they're going to do and when they're going to do it before they do it. 81% of the time, they tell someone what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. You understand what that means? That means that 81% of the time, we as loved ones, we know what they're feeling. We know what they're thinking. We even know what they're planning. Yet we stay silent. Why? I understand that some of us may fear that the troubled person might feel betrayed if we tell someone, or maybe we fear that getting involved means it wasn't just a joke and it wasn't just a threat. Getting involved means it's real. We don't want it to be real, but I hate to break it to you, but getting involved doesn't make it any more real than it already is. Our fears do not excuse our silence. They don't. So what can we do to make sure that when we're made aware of someone's suicidal ideation, we choose to get them help instead of walking away? Well, I think the next step to do that is to get honest. The scariest thing I ever did was own up to my past and tell my story. In our society, we are so obsessed with image, you know, giving this false idea that we have it all together. But where has that gotten us? The walls that we've built around our hurt have fostered more than 44,000 suicides a year. Not to mention 25 suicide attempts for every death by suicide. Raw vulnerability is terrifying, but not as terrifying as the thought of losing our loved ones to suicide. When I say get honest, 
I'm not asking that you talk about suicide if you've never experienced it. I'm not asking that you walk up to every stranger and tell them the darkest parts of your life. I'm just saying, stop wearing a mask. Stop pretending that you're having a good day when you're not. Stop lying. Stop acting like you have it all together when you don't. Show people who are battling suicide that it's okay if they don't have it all together. Show them that, yeah, everybody has their crap they have to deal with. Be transparent in the way that you choose to live your life. I understand if you feel like that honesty is scary. Because it is. I've been there. Still there. But getting real about the tough stuff is the only way that we're going to be able to help people who feel like they're alone in this. I know it's tough, but step three, get brave. I went to school with this girl for about four years, but up until our senior year, we had never spoken, different social circles. But for Suicide Prevention Week of 2016, I wrote an article about my suicide attempt and I published it and she read it online. A few days later, she walked up to me and told me that she read my article and followed that up with, I want to die. I was the first of many people who have chosen to confide in me about their struggles since I started talking about mine. It's a ripple effect. When someone feels safe and secure because of your honesty, they'll choose to be honest too. It's so hard every time someone tells me something like that. You know, I question, what if I say the wrong thing and they end their life? Or what do I even say in this situation? More often than not, I question, why can't I make it better? I understand that fear. And I get it. One time I was talking to this really awesome teacher that I had about what I was struggling with. And I randomly felt this overwhelming wave of shame. And I began apologizing to her for telling her these things, for burdening her. Her response was pretty awesome. Um, you know, people say, you won't remember what people said, but you'll remember how they made you feel. So I'm pretty sure the following quote isn't exactly verbatim, but she meant something along the lines of, I'd rather face these thoughts with you than lose you any day. And I think that that's pretty powerful. I think we all need to be like her. We all need to choose to tell that fear that it has no place here. We need to be brave and talk about something that is so very scary. So let's be like my teacher. Let's choose to save lives. Let's talk about it. When I say let's talk, I'm not asking you to walk up to the person sitting next to you and be like, hey, 44,000 people die by suicide each year. Or, hey, one time I tried to kill myself. Like, that's not, not what I'm asking of you. I'm just asking that you don't run from it. Don't avoid it. When you see someone who is hurting, Walk up to them, please. Just walk up to them and talk about it. It is not that hard to be there for people. You walk up to them and you tell them that whatever they're feeling, they can share with you. Tell them that they can tell you those dark thoughts that they're having. Just face it. Be there for people. I know that sometimes helping others requires us to be honest and vulnerable about our own struggles. And that means we have to overcome a lot of shame sometimes. But like I've said, we cannot let shame and we cannot let fear stop us. So from this day forward, I ask that you would join me and no longer sit in silence while suicide takes our friends and our family. Let's get educated, let's get honest, Let's get brave, but most of all, let's talk. Thank you. All right, so um, really the most important thing that I can say about suicide prevention is let's talk about it. You know, like um, I can give you all the resources in the world and you might say, okay, but what can I actually do to help? 
Um, and we have to talk about it. We have to be willing to listen and to really hear what people are telling us. Um, and when it's your own child, um, or your child's friend and they're coming to you and they're telling you these things, it can be really hard to hear. Um, but being willing to listen and talk to them honestly about what they're feeling and get them the help they need is all the difference in the world. So some actual steps you can take, showing you care, listening carefully and talking openly um, and being specific and remembering to take care of yourself too. There are lots of crisis helplines and websites that are great resources. Um, the more you hear about it and educate yourself about it, the easier it is to talk about it. Um, there are counseling services that you can contact. Um, you can also call for a mental health assessment if you're concerned or um, your child has shown some warning signs. Removing potential threats to safety if you believe they might hurt themselves, um, removing things from their reach that they can hurt themselves with, um, you know, kind of like we do for toddlers. <laughs> and supervising and monitoring them. Someone who is suicidal or experiencing those thoughts or may have a plan is far more likely to follow through with it if they are left alone or they believe that they are alone. So um, in my opinion with teenagers, I would 100% rather than be mad at me or frustrated with me or annoyed with me um, as long as they are alive. And I tell students that pretty frequently. Like, you can be mad at me about this if you want to. That's okay, but I still have to tell somebody to keep you safe. So there are some resources here. Um, and Ms. Carpenter will be posting this, so it's available to you. You are also welcome to email or call myself or Ms. McGaugh if you have more questions or concerns. And I believe we have some more time if you are here and have questions now. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. We really appreciate you. Um, we do have one parent that joined us today. So if you have any questions awesome. in the chat, I am going to stop our recording just so that we can have a conversation here. Thank you so much for all of those that are watching this video later in their own time. We appreciate you keeping your children safe. And uh, please let us know if there's anything we can do to help you. Thanks.